Welcome to The Div and our series on professional expectations. I'm Lieutenant Navy Alex Wood from 4th Canadian Division Public Affairs in Toronto, Ontario. As members of the profession of arms, we are held to high standards and are expected to uphold the values of the Canadian Armed Forces. Our eight professional expectations are provided through the Canadian Armed Forces ethos, trusted to serve. Our topic today is accepting unlimited liability and joining me are Lieutenant Colonel Raphael McKenzie and Master Warrant Officer Kevin Walker. Lieutenant Colonel Raphael McKenzie is the G3, J3 for the 4th Canadian Division and Joint Task Force Central, responsible for coordinating the training and support to all military operations within the division. He has served with the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the Royal Canadian Regiment, the Canadian Special Operations Regiment, and the 4th Canadian Division Headquarters and Joint Task Force Central. He has deployed on Operation Unifier and Operation Impact, and has participated in NORAX in Canada's High Arctic, and as well participated in Operation Lentis 2019 as part of the Immediate Response Unit responding to flooding in the Ottawa Valley. He is a graduate of the Canadian Forces College Joint Command and Staff Program and has a Master's in Defense Studies from the Royal Military College. Master Warrant Officer Kevin Walker is the G3 Sergeant Major within the 4th Canadian Division Headquarters. He is the Senior Non-Commissioned Officer responsible for domestic and expeditionary missions. He has served in the 3rd Battalion, the Royal Canadian Regiment, and Canadian Special Operations Regiment. He has deployed multiple times, including tours in Bosnia, Macedonia, Afghanistan, Poland, and Iraq. He is a trained sniper and deployed on one operation in this capacity. Other career highlights include multiple joint airborne exercises held in various locations throughout the United States, and he was a member of the 2012 Skyhawks team as a parachute demonstrator. He will be posted back to the field force this summer. Well, welcome to both of you. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for taking the time, um, especially in, in the capacity that, that you are serving, uh, you know, as, as G3 and, and G3 Sergeant Major. Um, I want to start off just by sort of introducing the audience to, to who you are a little bit more. Um, so, sir, if I can start with you, you know, let's, let's go back. You've been in the Army for a couple of years now, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's take it back to, to, to your starting point. And why did you decide to join the Canadian Armed Forces in the first place? No, oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, so actually I joined the Canadian Armed Forces a little bit later in life. So I was in my late 20s. Uh, it was during a period of time when the Canadian Armed Forces were, were very high profile. They were in the media a lot. It was during the Afghan war. Um, and it was kind of for the first time in my life where the Canadian Armed Forces were really kind of put out into the public spectrum. And we were able to see through television and news media exactly what was going on over there. And so I was very proud of that. And I got the sense that the Canadian Armed Forces was really doing something to contribute to making the world a better place. And at the time, I kind of reevaluated and as a recently married person with young children, I kind of felt like I wanted to do something more, something meaningful to make the world a better place for them. And so that's what drew me to the Canadian Armed Forces. Amazing. Um, and, and what about for yourself? MWL? Yeah, so uh, my position on it at the time uh, was probably not as quite as eloquent as uh, the bosses, but it was more, uh, I didn't really have a lot of direction in life, didn't know where I was going. Didn't know how to educate myself, what I, what kind of education I needed, what kind of employment I wanted. And every, every sort of step kept coming back to the military, coming back to I want to be a part of a team, be a part of like a, a group that is collectively, you know, working towards something. And that, that just kind of was even though I didn't know like what I wanted to do. I knew the environment I wanted around whatever I was doing. So that was more important to me at, at that time in my life. I always find it really interesting what draws the individual into the organization. And yet, 
we become part of this collective team, you know, and now here are the two of you who came obviously from very different points of view, mm -hmm. but working together for, you know, the, the same mission, uh, if you will. Yeah. Um, so what, what does a, now that you're in this role currently at, at uh, Fordiv and, and JTFC, what's a typical day look like for you? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, at the division level, which I think it's important uh, to, to, you know, kind of explain a little bit about the organization of the Canadian Army. And so the division is the highest tactical level within the Canadian Army. Uh, in Canada, we have multiple divisions. Each are approximately, uh, you know, 14,000 uh, members uh, that conduct all of the missions for, for, for Canada, uh, both domestically and abroad. And so for me, a typical day is engaging and interacting with all of the continental codes, which form the headquarters for the division. So we have specialties or streams within a staff context where, you know, some branches are responsible for personnel management, whereas other branches are responsible specifically for support and resourcing. And so I work in the G3 branch, which is very much focused on operations. And so that is sort of at the center of the hub where all of these disparate elements are pulled together. And so all of the training, equipping, um, education, resourcing, um, and direction, command direction come together to make sure that we have people um, prepared to conduct the business for the Canadian Armed Forces um, internationally and at home. And so it's a, it's a lot about communicating. It's a lot about being um, educated and aware of what the priorities, priorities are uh, for the Canadian Army. Uh, and it's a lot about kind of taking the higher level direction, which we call strategic intent and operational planning and communicating that down to like what we call the coal face. So the lowest tactical level in an understandable direction that lets them know what they need to do uh, on behalf of uh, the Canadian Armed Forces. So, so you don't do much at all in a day, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, that's right, that's right. So it, it's, tr it's true, like when you think about the traditional uh, you know, image of uh, an infantry officer. So I'm an infantry officer mm -hmm. and, you know, that's a soldier. And so when you think about, you know, the imagined kind of, you know, picture of that, you think of, you know, a, a leader in uniform uh, with all kinds of equipment, with a rifle and a radio and like doing the job, usually in kind of like a forested uh, environment. And so like, that's a part of my career. Uh, was a part of my early stages of my career, but this is like very much not doing. This is very much having an understanding of what is required down at the tactical levels, having some insight and understanding about what's driving those tactical level activities and being a conduit for communication and then making sure that all of those kind of ingredients come together at the right time in an efficient, clear, succinct way uh, to get the job done. MWO, you've had a really varied career. You've done a lot of, uh, you know, from from the the short intro we described, a lot of very interesting uh, things. Uh, I, I'm sure your time with the Skyhawks that must have been amazing. Uh, but in your current role, like like, what's the most exciting part of the job for you now? So the exciting part for uh, what's going on around me right now is actually understanding what I have dealt with for 18 years in the field force and how we got to that and, and how miscommunications happen and how uh, the perspective from a battalion on why am I being told to do this to now seeing the outer sort of peripheral of that and understanding why that specific thing was a priority uh, that that's sort of the uh, what I take from the job the most because uh, I mean I'm not blind to the fact that I am definitely not the uh, the most skilled person as a staff officer. It's not what I'm built for, but uh, I also appreciate the opportunity I've been given to to come to the Div HQ and find that out. I mean my my typical workday is quite a bit different as uh, uh, sort of senior NCO. My, my first reaction is what is the boss doing? What does he need done? And how do I support his intent? And I will always stay that way wherever I work, wherever I move to. So I'm, I'm keying off what the boss is telling me is priority and, and I'm following 
his lead, but there's also a lot of like internal management of people, internal management of expectations and bringing a little bit uh, into the team on this is this is a field force concept that I think some staff officers might have forgotten along the way. Uh, and this is why we're doing this. The boss has a very, very strict PT sort of uh, plan that doesn't take a lot of time, but every member has to be present on Thursdays. And uh, like I onboarded that. I think it's great. It's bringing a little touch of what the field force has to deal with and, and putting it right into the face of the people that actually have to push those orders out. Gives them a bit of an insight. That's an important concept. It's, it's like literally the foundation of how the Army operates is the partnership between the officer corps and the NCO corps. And so like it's very difficult to, to, to define what it is that the Division G3 does without also talking about what the Division G3 Sergeant Major does because it is a partnership. And I mean, how many, how many debates have we had where <laughs> you're saying this is, this is what we're going to do? And I might disagree slightly on certain components. Eventually, we come to either the boss is like, no, this is happening because he's got a, a deeper insight of the problem, or mm, I can kind of see where you're coming from. But when his office door opens and I walk out, that's the message that's out. It's we support each other in that concept at that time, the minute the door is open. Yeah, I think I think the maybe the cliche that we we use to help people, you know, better understand the concept is it's like furious advice furious advice uh, as part of the partnership, but then once the decision is made, and we arrive at decisions together, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately I own the responsibility for them, but we arrive at them together, and once we get to where we need to in terms of a decision, it's loyal execution. And so we work in partnership there. And so like it's clear, like, you know, it's, it's great the way that we did this intro is, you know, we're both middle-aged men, about the same age, grew up in, you know, small town Canada, very similar. But we have, you know, a soldier now, a very senior NCO, who's worked his way through the ranks from private to where he is now. It takes an entire career to create a sergeant major. And he's seen, you know, for lack of a better term, the battlefield from every position in between. And so it's all of that experience and knowledge and context that he's able to bring into the partnership, whereas same age, much, much fewer years service, very different experiences, having seen maybe similar environments, but from very different perspectives. And I think that that's truly the strength is through mutual respect. Um, we are able to combine the best of both to arrive at decisions that both address mission success. But at the same time, we do so in a responsible and efficient way, because the most important resource we have is human resources which is, as a human resource management expert, sergeants, major, um, they own that space. That's the, the perfect segue, thank you for that, to our, our topic, which is accepting unlimited liability. Mm -hmm. I, I think back for myself, and, and I've got fewer years than, than either of you, but I think that th was the first time that I heard this term mm -hmm. was in basic training. There's a lecture that you receive and it's explained what the concept is. And I think for myself personally, it was that moment where I said, hey, you're really in the military. This is, this mm -hmm. is serious. So with that, you know, all of the operational experience that both of you bring to the table, uh, obviously you're not strangers to this concept. Mm -hmm. So maybe, sir, I'll start with you. Um, just kind of briefly, if you can sort of describe from an infantry soldier, uh, infantry officer's perspective, what what does this concept really mean for for you in okay. a practical sense? Oh yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to, to 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 do that. You know, at the end of the day, unlimited liability is probably the most unique um, characteristic of any professional um, military, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, if you think about like the reason of existence for the Canadian Armed Forces, really domestically at home, it's a force of last resort. And internationally, abroad, it's the last line of defense for Canada. And so, like, last is used twice there for a reason. And it means that when the Canadian Armed Forces is done, when it's exhausted, if it has failed, there's nothing else. There's nothing behind us. So it can't fail. 
And so, so by virtue of that, it's different from other professions. And so there are many professions where through a sense of duty, you know, we think of emergency first responders, for example, within a domestic concept, uh, context, you know, they accept risk. Mm -hmm. They put themselves or they go willingly into situations where they're exposed to risk, where physical, mental, emotional uh, damage could be possible, maybe is even likely. They could even lose their lives. Um, the difference is, uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, it's not a choice. So the choice is made upon entry. And so as a professional military, we all make a choice to put duty and service above self-interest. And in making that decision, we enter into like a, an informal contract that says, in order for the military to achieve favorable odds, to be more likely to succeed, we accept that we can be found in situations where we are exposed to environments that are detrimental to our own well-being. We may be forced into situations that potentially could lead to injury or death. We could be ordered into situations of certain injury and death. Um, other things, uh, we may find ourselves in situations where certain medical interventions need to be used in order to save life and limb in, you know, fiscally and resource deficient environments. Whereas in the civilian side of things, as a citizen of Canada, there are certain inalienable rights. And for the rest of the Canadian public, you have a right to work in a safe environment. And there are certain minimum standards of safety that need to be adhered to. Even um, within professions that are somewhat dangerous, every member of that workforce has the right to refuse to do something that they know to be likely to cause injury or death to themselves. That is not the same, uh, that is not the same situation for Canadian Armed Forces. MWO, you've uh had multiple tours, been on you know, lots of different types of operations and then all sorts of trainings. I mean, just, you know, the list is, is pretty exhaustive uh, in the experiences that you've had. And so certainly no stranger to, to the concept. How, how does a professional soldier, uh, a military professional, find the, I guess, the courage, the, the tenacity to actually follow through. I mean, it's one thing to talk about it conceptually, right, and the idea of it, but to actually act on this idea of unlimited liability, how does one find the, the, the fortitude to, to do it? Yeah, so the, like the, you started the uh, conversation pretty uh, interestingly, and that's you know, when you first heard of the term unlimited liability. And I think joining the forces, I think everybody kind of has that, like a little bit of a context of what that is, but they might not have known the word. I, I, I didn't hear that word until I was probably 10 years in the military, which is, is pretty crazy because I, I mean, I'd already been to Afghanistan at this point. So, and, and I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Okay, I, I, I get it. But like for soldiers, it, and you, you hear the cliche, it's, a, it's about the person to the left and to the right of you. But it, it's very true. You're all stuck in this situation together, right? You're stuck in this situation together. And you're, you're able to draw strength knowing that that could happen to your, your friend. Or that could happen to one of your partners. Or that could happen to your, your boss or a subordinate. And we're, we're all there saying, you know what? I'd rather that happen to me than that happen to them. So we're all in this together. We're willing to, we're willing to accept this. It's, I mean, when I first joined, it was like you follow orders and, and something, something rotten could happen to you, right? But, but later, later on in life, uh, when you actually start putting it into context, it's, it's about, you know, it's, it's about protecting, you know, who's around you and, and trying to get through that situation together, but understanding that it might not, might not work out. Yeah. And sir, you know, it's interesting too in your role because sort of double-hatted, if you will, both Fortive and JTFC. Yeah. On, the, on the JTFC side, we deal with a lot of domestic operations. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking about even right now, there are places in Canada with, with forest fires. We've had, as, as in your, your experience, uh, the flooding response in, in Oplentis. So it's not 
only going out into a, a foreign theater of operations, but also even domestically, we could find ourselves in, in this situation. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so, so I, I, I think that perhaps, and maybe you can expand on this, that maybe a lot of, you know, for military folks, again, we understand it, but for maybe Canadians not as familiar, this is part of our uh, service to Canada as well, domestically. Yeah, it really is. I'm so happy that you bring up the domestic side. We, we, we tend to have sort of a focus on expeditionary operations. We have romantic notions about courage under fire and things like that. But it does transcend all aspects of duty uh, in uniform. And so when you think about like a couple of the things that I said at the beginning and from a domestic perspective, Canada really does have the view that the Canadian Armed Forces within a domestic context is a force of last resort. And so what does that mean? It means that like all other reasonable options have been fully exhausted before we're committed to the task. And so in that case, you know, often these situations, as you've pointed out, involve natural disasters, which can be extraordinarily dangerous. Infrastructure is failing. Um, you're talking about floods, forest fires, storms, incredibly inclement, very difficult, challenging environments. And, and I think at the end of the day, you know, there is, there is risk in anything that the Canadian Army gets involved in or the Canadian Armed Forces gets involved in because the stakes are high. And if the Canadian Armed Forces is committed to a task, then you know that there's nothing else there that's available. Uh, and so there's no margin for error, really. Uh, there are no failed tasks. And certainly, uh, you know, as duty-bound individuals, the protection, security, and welfare of Canadians in Canada is absolutely top of mind, and we can't fail there. And so definitely unlimited liability factors in. I would say maybe, like, some context for that is like, well, why, why would we use the Canadian Armed Forces in a domestic context? And I think it comes back to like sort of why we exist um, in our current roles uh, as the operations kind of team uh, within the division. And so that's all about making sure that our members have adequate training, you know, the best possible equipment. Um, the, the best possible leadership and education to equip them to deal in any environment against any sort of challenge. And so how do you accomplish that? Well, you do it through realistic and challenging training. Um, you do it through drills. You know, this concept of uh, unlimited liability is kind of philosophical. And really, if you get down to like logic, like at the real human level, like what profession runs toward the sound of gunfire. What normal, unprepared human being would do that? Like, it's just not logical. And so, like, we have these romantic notions. We have these concepts that we see in popular media and maybe stories that we've learned from family members and friends who have previous service. And so we aspire to that. We know that it's admirable. And so maybe that's what gets you through the door. But then what makes you capable of like showing courage under fire and staying in the fight is it comes down to training and it comes down to trust. And so we understand that we accept unlimited liability, but we trust that our commanders and our leaders would never take advantage of that. And so that every reasonable step and measure is taken to reduce risk. And so then when we are exposed to risk, it's been mitigated as much as is practicable, and we, and we trust. We trust that our higher uh, leaders and commanders take that very, very seriously, and they, and they, they do everything in their power. They spend the resources. They spend the time and effort in making sure that our members have really hard, really challenging training so that when it comes time, it's not really a decision, it's more of a drill. Yeah, you know, I, I love the, the piece uh, you threw in there about trust and, and leadership. Uh, like just looking back on my career, I remember us getting ready for a deployment. The RSM at the time, who, he, I actually don't think he was really the wisest man around, but he was wise in this moment. 
and he he told us we're gonna we're gonna back off. We're gonna we're gonna do everything to do with all all of our uh, medical work back drills, all the medevac stuff. We're gonna redo it all. And I, I thought we were pretty hot right off, right off the bat. And uh, later on, he explained to the NCOs. He's like, the troops have to see that we're gonna do everything we can to to protect them because at the end of the day, the environment they're going into. It's not normal, and they have to be able to trust their leadership in knowing that at the lowest level, we're going to do what we can to get them, if they are a casualty, off the battlefield. It's a, it's a two-way street, and I, I, I liked the, the throwing about uh, it's a notion, but then how do we get through that notion? Because it's not natural. No, I agree. Yeah. I appreciate this conversation so much, and I, I'm sure we could, we could spend a lot of time on this. It's, uh, it's really insightful and, and I think really important, and not only for, for us as military members, but even for, for Canadians to understand just the level of commitment and sacrifice that uh, Canadian Armed Forces members actually commit themselves to. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, remarkable, I, I guess would be the word I, I would describe it with. But, as we, we sort of wrap up, I, I'd like to just ask each of you, uh, starting with yourself, sir. So uh, you're, you're going to be leaving the division uh, onto a new uh, posting uh, this summer. Uh, what do you look forward to in the next steps in your career? Well, it's, I, I think always, for me, it comes back to like being the part of a team. You know, uh, like I'm a member of an amazing team within the division headquarters right now, and you form bonds and you create something together um, that you're extremely proud of. And so like that, there's a there's a pain in that. But like the exciting part is that now we I'm able to take everything that I've learned from my teammates. And I move into another team where I get to meet new people. I get to bring a little bit of me into that, and I get to get so much from them. Um, and honestly, I think at the core of duty is that it's being a part of something bigger. I think Sergeant Major said it perfectly in his, uh, his introductory comments is being a part of something so much bigger, um, you know, conceptually and practically. And so that's what I'm looking forward to most. MWO, back to you the field force this summer so kind of back to your roots i guess mm -hmm. uh what are you looking forward to what's next uh, so yeah I'm, I'm back to back to my roots but it's a complete change in direction i'll be working with a lot of different trades mechanics clerks uh, every every trade that it takes to run a run a unit and i think i've got a lot of the tools just sort of working here in this group to sort of understand you know the, the, not all infantry people anymore there's like some different thoughts some different different beliefs uh you know, figuring out how to actually sustain a battalion uh, that like I'll have a, a big piece in that. Beyond that, I try not to look too far in the future. Uh, I mean, same thing, like as, as long as I'm part of a team and can and can get behind what whatever they're doing, wherever they're doing, I don't know what the next bounds are. Uh, I get asked quite often on career manager uh, interviews and stuff, and I don't care to speculate on that. I'll just just take uh, a year at a time. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you both very much for taking the time again out of your very busy schedules and, and uh, sharing your, your insights and, and your thoughts with us today and, and wish you both the best in the next postings. So that's going to do it for our show uh, today. This has been another edition of The Div and our series on professional expectations. From Toronto, I'm Lieutenant Navy Alex Wood from 4th Canadian Division Public Affairs. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We'll see you next time.